Genesis chapter 11. I want to try an experiment and see if it works. I've mentioned this morning during Sunday school, there's a man, a college professor by the name of James White, wrote a book called The King James Only Controversy. And I watched a a video debate that he had with um, Dr. Jack Mormon, I think is his name, Uh, He's a Baptist preacher and a staunch King James supporter. He's written several books on it and so on. And so he was on a a British television show, probably a a Christian type show in the United Kingdom. And they were debating one another. And James White, you know, spilled out several things that why the... King James couldn't be right in every place and why it was poorly translated and they used terrible manuscripts and King James translators were, you know, like children with coloring books and they didn't know what they were doing and all this stuff. And then he said this, and I've heard this before. And he said, those of you who say you believe the King James Bible, which King James Bible do you believe in? Do you believe in the 1611 King James Bible? You believe in the 1729 King James Bible, the 1769 revision of the King James Bible, and they're all different. And I knew he was lying. I knew he was lying because I went to um, back when Don Robertson was pastor here and I was associate pastor. And we took a trip to the National Association meeting in in Charleston. Was it South Carolina, North Carolina? Anyway, we attended the denominational meeting and it just so happened that at that time, I was anti King James and there was going to be a lecture on the King James only issue given by the esteemed Greek professor of Free Will Baptist Bible College, Dr. Robert Piccarelli. And he said the exact same thing. He said... For those of you who say you believe the King James Bible, which King James Bible do you believe? Do you believe the 1611 King James Bible? Do you believe the 1729 King James Bible? The 1760 whatever King James Bible? Because they're all different. And I went, yeah, you idiots. First time I'd ever heard it, but I I believed it because he said it. And I wanted, and it's what I wanted. I believed it because... It's what I wanted him to say. I wanted him to say something like that to prove how wrong everybody was that believed the King James. And then God whipped me and made me one. So my wife, several years later, we're at a conference put on by Southwest Radio Church in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And they had a big book table. And on their book table, they had... One of these, it was smaller than this, but this is a facsimile of the original 1611 King James Bible. So what I'm going to do is I want you to turn and open your Bible to Genesis 11. And I'm going to read Genesis 11 out of this 1611 reprint. And then I'll ask you, are they the same or are they different? Okay, Genesis 11, verse 1. Uh, Let's see, what did I do here? We'll read down to verse 9. You follow along with me. And if if I read something that's not in your Bible, you raise your hand. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. 
And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound, confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Exactly the same? He lied. Now, he, what he didn't do was tell them it is true that there had been revisions of the King James since 1611. The first thing they did was change the spelling of the words. Okay? Because if you look at uh, this facsimile, and we had this out in the foyer, you could tell that the words are spelled slightly different. Okay? They also corrected typographical errors. In 1850, the American Bible Society asked this same question because there were some that were saying that the Bible that was produced in 1611 is, was not the Bible they had in 1850. So the American Bible Society sent some guys out to, to research this and bring a report back. And they said, other than spelling and other than typographical errors, the Bible that was produced in 1611 is identical to the Bible that we have right now in 1850. And it hasn't been revised since. Same Bible, same thing. So what James White did was deliberately lie and deliberately deceive people into thinking. And I confronted a young man several years ago at Bible camp in Niangua, Missouri. He was fresh out of Bible college and, and he brought the subject up. So I felt like enlightening him a little bit. And, I and he said that same thing to me. He said, but the, the Bible in 1611 is not the same as we have now. I said, it is too. He said, no, it isn't. It was written in Middle English and we don't speak that anymore. The, the, the King James now is written in later English. And I'm going, have you ever seen one? No. I said, then you have no idea what you're talking. He was a young guy, but he's very arrogant. I said, you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. I said, I believed that at one point. I believed it. And I said, I went and found out that they are exactly identical to one another. So um, that's one of the things that I'm going to might bring up next Sunday night. Again, I will be at um, Church of Many Blessings down in Fredericktown, Missouri. Basically Rose's backyard with all of her family down there. Huh? Yep, you ought to come down. You and Joe ought to come down. So we'll still have, like I say, we'll have Sunday service here, Sunday afternoon service at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. I'll leave, pack everything up, and, and take it down to Fredericktown. And y'all are willing to, y'all are more than welcome to come down and, and sit with us down there while we deal with this very, very important issue. All right? So we've read the scripture. God's word has not changed in over, well over 400 years, same Bible for 400 years. Meanwhile, the NIV, I counted up, has gone through five word revisions. Not spelling, not typo errors. Changing the words in its Bible five times since the New Testament came out in 73. The complete Bible was out in 78. So they had the 1978 edition, the 1984 edition, the 1993 edition, the 1996 edition, the 2008 edition, the 2011 edition. And the, the edition that's out now, the NIV, 
is basically the gender neutral Bible where they neutered the Bible. They neutered God. Instead of saying brethren, it says brothers and sisters. Instead of saying ye men, it, me, it says ye men and women. They added to it. That's not what the Bible said. They changed it. And they will keep changing it. Even the Southern Baptists, Southern Baptists didn't like the NIV for that reason because they basically pushed in the gender neutral language. So they issued the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which was the Southern Baptist own version of the Bible. And they now have included some of the gender neutral language. They've revised their own Bible for, and they basically did it because they didn't like the gender neutral, but they've gone to it anyway. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would fill our minds and our hearts with knowledge and understanding. Father, thank you for hearing us when we pray in the only language that most of us know. Thank you, dear God, for speaking to us in the only language that most of us know. We thank you, God, for opening our eyes, using us for your kingdom and your glory's sake. Bless our church. Bless this night's service and our study of your word in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. So I want, you to, I want you to contrast some things. In Genesis 11, I'm not opened up there. I have it in my notes. I don't have it opened up there. In Genesis 11, God sent a curse down from heaven in that he confused or confounded their language so that the person here who's mixing mortar or slime for the bricks to build the city and the tower, he speaks, they all speak the same language, and then boom, he goes to ask um, if the guy needs more mortar, and the guy says something, but the guy mixing the mortar doesn't know what he said now. And what did you say? The guy now all of a sudden is speaking a different language. And the guy's asking for more bricks but the man who can give him the bricks can't give it to him because he doesn't know what he's saying and all of a sudden now bada boom bada bing they can't build because nobody knows what anybody is saying contrast that with go to acts chapter 2 the curse of babbled language because everybody else's language to us sounds like babbling. Acts chapter 2, verse 7, They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judah or Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, and Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So compare those two things, or contrast those two things, because that's what they are. They're a contrast to each other. One, you have mass confusion. And on the day of Pentecost... You have the outpouring of God's Spirit bringing blessing to the people who are there hearing it. Blessing in the form of they're able to hear the Word of God given to them in their own language. They have understanding now. Comprehension. Instead of a rabbi reading Hebrew, now these disciples are preaching the word of God to these people in a language that they themselves understand. So it's a blessing. The curse, Genesis 11, God undoes the curse in Acts chapter 2. You have, you have confusion and chaos here in Genesis, but you have order now in Acts chapter 2. And they contrast one another. So I started on this last uh, Sunday about the issue of those that say that they speak in tongues. And there's some differences of opinion even amongst the tongues talkers. Uh, as I said, there are those, and I don't agree with it, but I respect it, 
because they're using scripture to back up what they believe. They will have someone in the service who will speak in an unknown tongue, and then another one will do it, and these are men, not women, and then someone may then interpret what they're saying. I, as I mentioned last week, I spoke to the pastors in Kenya. They do it this way. Some of them do. And I, you know, I, I don't argue against them. It's kind of like what I preached this morning. They're brethren. I believe they're brethren. I believe they believe the Bible. And so it's not my place to just punch them in the face and say, hey, you're being stupid. Quit believing that way. Um, God was basically telling me, let them go, Mike. They, I'm using them for a certain reason. Okay, even though I don't agree with what their view of tongues is, because they say, turn to First uh, Corinthians 13, that the tongues that they speak are an angelic prayer language, is what they say, and they get that from First Corinthians 13, where Paul said. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I may come as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So having heard that, I asked the question, is there any place in the Bible where angels are speaking, yet no one understands them? Um... The angel of the Lord that met Joshua just before he goes into Jericho, who I believe was the Lord, he spoke to Joshua. Did Joshua understand what he was saying? Every word. Um, the angel of the Lord that met Manoah, who was Samson's father, the angel spoke to Manoah and his wife. Did they understand what he was saying? Yes. The angel that was dispatched to give an answer to the prayer that Daniel prayed. Did Daniel understand what he was saying? Yes. When Gabriel, the angel, met the Virgin Mary and told her that she had conceived of the Holy Ghost, she was with child, he spoke to her. She understood every word he said without fail. So... Uh, the two angels that came with the Lord in Genesis 18 to meet Abram and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah not only fed them, but they conversed with them and they understood every word they said. Those two men then who were angels went to Lot, told Lot, we got to get you and your family out of this city. Lot understood every word they said. So the question was, does the Bible indicate that angels speak a different language? Yes, David. I'm getting to that. In fact, turn to Daniel 5. And in that case, an interpretation was given. Daniel chapter 5, verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand. This is Bel Belshazzar, um, son of Nebuchadnezzar. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall, the plaster of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his tr thought troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote together one against another. I, and I bet he had to go to the bathroom too. I just throw that in. The king cried aloud to bring, the astro bring in the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and shew me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom of heaven. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Think about what Jesus said. When, he, when Jesus began to teach his disciples, he, one of the first parables he taught them was the parable of the seed and the sower. And 
he gets, he teaches the parable. Then he gets along with his disciples and he said, the disciples ask him, Lord, what meaneth this parable? Jesus said, to you it is given to know the, the mysteries of the kingdom of, of God. But to them that are without, it is kept hidden from them. So God's people know things. And knowing, being formed or reformed in knowledge is one of the blessings from God. God doesn't speak to us in chaos, in words that we don't understand. Where's the blessing in that? Okay? It only comes when I can understand what God is saying. So, uh, that's what Belshazzar, that's what he's got going on here. He cannot understand this and he doesn't know what it means and he's freaking out over this. So now in verse 25, Daniel, this is the writing that was written. Mine, mine, tikel upharsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. So you have an unknown language unknown script but God's going to make it known this is the interpretation of the thing Mine, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it Tikel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting Perez thy kingdom is divided and actually that word Perez or Eupharsin seems to me to be related to Hebrew because the Hebrew word for uh, where it says Perez, thy kingdom is divided. The word Perez means breach. Who were the two sons of Judah? Zerah and Perez. And Perez was named Perez because he breached the womb. Okay. He came, even though the hand of Zerah came out and they wrote a, put a scarlet cord on that hand. When the hand went back in, Perez came out and they named him Perez because he breached the, the matrix of the womb. Uh, and so Perez, thy kingdom is divided, breached and given to the Medes and to the, to the Persians. Or, and, you know, maybe I'm reading that wrong. Maybe Perez means more about Persia than it does division or anything. But I kind of think it's sort of similar to Hebrew. Uh, now, Deuteronomy 28. There is a nation. There are, there exists a people that will come to this world. Think of what I just said. Meaning, they're not here. They're not from this world. Deuteronomy 28, great chapter. I encourage you to study this. And JR, you, you like kind of like history a little bit. When George Washington took the oath of office, they brought him a Bible and it was opened to Deuteronomy 28. He didn't just put his hand on a Bible and swear. It was opened to Deuteronomy 28. That stood out to me because I know De Deuteronomy 28. I know what it is. It's a covenant with a nation. Deuteronomy 28 basically says, if the people of this nation will follow my commandments, my judgments, my statutes, I'll bless them. If they refuse my statutes, I'm and he lists, there's a ton of curses that he sends. So here's one of the curses. In verse 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. How far? Light years. Light years. What is a light year? JR, do you remember what a, Callie, do you remember what a light year is? You graduated high school, right? A light, and I know you didn't, not yet. A light year... Hope, do you know what a light year is? I just now noticed you both are wearing the same. Yeah. Ah, same but different. Okay. A light year is the distance that light travels in one year. 186,000 miles per second. Okay. That's a light year. 
So uh, this nation that God's going to bring is from far, very far. From the end of the earth. And there's a line in the atmosphere that basically represents the end of the earth. Once you get above that line, Neil Armstrong was test piloting before he walked on the moon. He was a test pilot and he had this rocket airplane. They took him up high altitudes, let him go, and then he went higher than the plane that took him up there. And he's up above now the atmosphere of the earth. And all of a sudden now he realizes he tries to go back down, but he keeps bouncing off the atmosphere. And his the things on his plane, the wings and the flaps and everything like that won't work because there's no air to work on. So he keeps trying to go down. He keeps bouncing off the atmosphere. And finally, he realized there was jet nozzles on those wings. And he used those jet nozzles to turn the plane kind of crooked to slice into the atmosphere line to get back to where his flaps could take control. Saved his life. His, it, it was like second nature to him. That's why they picked him. He was good at what he was the only one that could have done that. So anyway, uh, that's where the end of the earth is. It's beyond the earth. From the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Now, years ago when I read this, I thought, well, that must be Russia. That could be Russia because everybody says Gog and Magog and so on is Russia. And they're coming down from the north and so on. Um, but then I didn't know that a, a lot of the Jews who live in Israel now were Russian Jews. So it's not Russia. Because there's still a lot of people in Israel who know Russian. Whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A nation of fierce countenance. These are not humans. They're not humans. Which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land, until, he be until thou be destroyed. Which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. So God's telling Israel, he's telling us that there is a group of people, a nation, he calls them. And the word nation means like ethnicity. And it's a word related to their DNA. Okay. Uh, Asian people have something different in their DNA that determines their features. Um, the Africans have something in their DNA that determines their features. The Caucasians have something in their DNA that determines their features. So that's how part of how God divided the nations. But this nation, there's something in their makeup, their genetic makeup, that causes them to have a very fierce countenance. Have you ever seen like a totem pole? The images on a totem pole are very mean looking okay um a lot of the um statues of gods from various places around the world have a very angry look about them fierce countenance and that means they look mean crocodiles don't look like dolphins dolphins have a smile on their mouth crocodiles don't have a smile on their mouth they have mean look OK, they look mean that that's God's way of telling us. Don't mess with them. OK, you can pet a dolphin. You cannot pet an alligator. All right. But he said their tongue, thou shalt not understand. So that leads me to believe that it can't be any earth language because we know all of them. Somebody in this world knows 
everybody else's language. All languages can be deciphered. Google does that now. If you get a website that's from Italy, you have Google translate the website for you. So electronic means certainly we can understand any language that's being spoken. But this promise here, God says, you're not going to understand the word they're saying. Now, there's a second witness to this. Turn to Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5. Verse 15. God said, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. A nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. So now we have two witnesses. And both are saying the same thing. God's going to bring them from a very far place. Number one. Number two. It's a mighty nation. A very powerful nation. They have abilities that no other nation on the earth has. Number three. They speak a language that nobody knows. Nobody knows. And nobody will know what that language is. Daniel 8, 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to full, a king of fierce countenance. That's exactly what he said about the nation in Deuteronomy 28, was that that would be a nation of fierce countenance. Cruel looking mean looking nation a king of fierce countenance understanding dark sentences now think about that phrase according to the bible the words of the bible are light thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path okay uh so the word of God brings light. The entrance of thy words giveth light, the Bible says. But in this instance, this king, who has a fierce countenance, speaks and understands dark sentences. Language that is not a language of light, it's a language of darkness. It's a language that Nobody understands. It doesn't bring light and knowledge and understanding. It brings darkness and chaos and confusion. You can't understand what this guy is saying. Um, Proverbs, turn to Proverbs 23. This, if you look up on the screen, this was a, a facsimile of the Los Angeles Daily Times, April 18th, 1906. This was a description of what's known as the Azusa Street Revival. Now, up until 1908, there weren't churches that, quote unquote, spoke in unknown tongues. This was a new thing that rose up. And you, and you have a lot of that going on about this same time. In the late 1800s, mid 1800s, you have Ellen White saying that everybody's got the gospel all wrong and God's appointed her to correct the gospel. The gospel is you must go to church on Saturday. Joseph Smith, the same thing. All the churches have it wrong. They don't understand the gospel. I have the Book of Mormon. That's the new gospel and I'm going to restore it. Um, you have uh, Charles Taze Russell who um, started the Jehovah's Witness cult, he also, everybody's got it wrong, all the churches are wrong, I'm here to restore the true gospel, and so on and so on and so on. So you have all these movements going on in the 1800s, early 1900s now, they're taking it up a notch. So now you have an event that took place, a sort of a, what we would call a Pentecostal revival. This is really the beginnings of the Pentecostal movement. Started in America, in Los Angeles, 1908, called the Azusa Street Revival. And what, and look, notice how, I get to use my pen tonight here. Notice how the, the Los Angeles Daily Times wrote, recorded it. Weird babble of tongues. 
New sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Wild scene last night on Azusa Street. Gurgle of wordless talk by a sister. That's how they described it. Gurgle and babble. Because these people were speaking in words that no one understood. Proverbs 23, verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? And who hath babbling? And remember what wine and strong drink indicate in the Bible. False doctrine. Not knowing. Confusion. When you're drunk, your head's messed up. You're confused. You don't remember things. You don't know things. You do things you wouldn't ordinarily do. And you speak in a way nobody can understand a word you're saying. Okay? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. And there is a spirit that is behind this. So, yes. I do believe that there is... There are angels who speak a language that nobody knows. And when those spirits inhabit somebody, they cause that person to speak in a language that nobody knows. Now, two things. Number one, and I've mentioned this before, I do believe that some people fake it and can fake it pretty good. And all you have to do is record them or get recordings of them speaking. And you'll hear repeated phrases. Okay. I've listened to Rodney Howard Brown, who they call the Holy Ghost bartender. He's serving up the Holy Ghost, making people drunk. And I've heard him speak, quote unquote, speak in tongues enough to know that he uses the same repeated phrases and patterns of phrases over and over again. So is he possessed of a devil that's causing him to speak in a language nobody knows? Probably not. He's just possessed of a devil that lies to everybody. And he's practiced this language and can do it. Okay. So I do believe that a lot of that goes on. Ecclesiastes 10, 11. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and a babbler is no better. So how does God see this issue of these people speaking in a language that they say is a heavenly prayer language, a prayer tongue? And by the way, they believe that their prayer language gives them powers that us Baptists don't have. That they can curse disease out of their body by speaking in tongues. That they can draw finances to their bank accounts by speaking in these tongues. They can, they can use this language to create wealth and to create health. And it's the only way to really get in touch with God is to speak in this heavenly prayer language because God just doesn't hear us Baptists pray in our prayer, in our language. He only hears the prayers that are spoken in tongues. 1 Timothy 6, 20. O Timothy, keep, thou, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings. And oppositions of science falsely so called. Paul told Timothy to avoid the babbling. Stay clear of that. Don't, don't invite that into your church. Don't let it happen in your church. I, I want you to be prepared. It's... Uh, it's only come up once in all the years that I've been here. Uh, we had a, a woman visit. And she came down to the altar. I'm trying to remember how it all came about. But I went to pray with her and she said that God had sent her here and, and that she had the gift of tongues. And would it be okay for her to start praying in tongues? And I said, no, it wouldn't be. So I'm putting you on notice now. If somebody comes into this church, stands up and starts that, I will put a stop to it. I'll have to. 
2 uh, Timothy 2.16, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And see, here's, here's what's really going on behind the scenes. You have people, and I'm not saying this of everybody who speaks in tongues. But you have people whose life is full of sin. Yet they go to church. They go to a Pentecostal or charismatic church. And they use tongues as a spiritual cover for their sins. In other words... They, they make themselves, they, once they start speaking in tongues, everybody in that church believes that guy's full of the Holy Ghost. Wow, listen to him, man. He is full of the Holy Ghost. He is speaking in tongues. Man, God must be rich in him. But it's a lie. The guy's an adulterer or the guy's a drunk or whatever. And he's using those tongues to make it look like God favors him somehow, some way. You see how it works? They will, that's why he said, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And as long as this guy, or whoever it is, this woman, as long as they continue to speak in tongues and, and exhibit these gifts of the Spirit, that tells him, I can still sin all I want to, and God still favors me. I can't out sin God. That's dangerous. So more than likely, what's happened is God's turned this guy over. To be a reprobate. Now, there's a book, I have it in my collection, written by Dr. Stephen Greer. Stephen Greer is a medical doctor, ER physician, sharp guy. But early on in his college days, he started, he started getting in contact with what he thought were alien entities. And they actually saved his life. They, he was dying of a, of a, he had a, he had a blood infection and he was dying of it, didn't know it. And they saved his life. They healed him. So he would go out and he could meditate and call these UFOs in. He could call them in. These orbs and flying discs and whatever. So he's been in contact with what he believes are aliens from a, higher dimension and a different planet. But what they are is devils. They're familiar spirits. So here's what, here's what Stephen Greer, this is how he describes his contact with these aliens. He says, while, and, and this happened to him while he was in college. He said, while still in this state, asleep, I continued to have some kind of ongoing dialogue with these extraterrestrial beings. My roommate told me quite some time later that for a number of months he would awaken late at night and would hear me speaking quietly in my sleep. He said, you were speaking, but with a language not of this world. Greer says, and I thought, oh my God, somehow I was in a state of consciousness where I would connect to the language used by the Eli. The Eli. What's that word from? El. The Hebrew word for God is El. And he was hearing that very clearly. He said, absolutely, it was not an earth language. And I can tell you that speaking in tongues is not ex an exclusive Christian practice. Let me explain about the God Apollo. The God Apollo was the God of prophecy. He could foresee the future. And he had a temple in Delphi and in that temple was called the Oracle of Delphi. Oracle and Delphi are both names of computer software companies. Okay? So if you wanted to know, let's say you wanted to know if you were going to have successful crops this year, if your harvest was going to be great, you would go to the temple of Apollo and you would pay the money, give the gift or whatever, and the oracle was a woman, the priestess of Del Delphi, the temple. She would then go into a, a, like a holy place 
And there would be these women in here who had dedicated their lives. They were sequestered women. And the oracle would then bring the request to the, to the oracle. And these women would speak and chant to the god Apollo. And the god Apollo would then fill these women with his knowledge and they would speak in a language that no one could understand. The only person in the, in the whole world who could understand it was the high priestess, who was the oracle. So these four women would speak in an unknown tongue. The high priestess would then interpret it. And she would then go out to the outer court and deliver the message to the man who paid the money to have the prophecy given to him. Okay? So this kind of stuff has gone on. Throughout the centuries, in pagan rituals all around the world, so the idea of an unknown tongue spoken by a religious person is not exclusive to Christianity. Uh, here's a book called The Fairy Way. And it's about, believe it or not, fairies as real entities. It's not teaching like fairies for little kids. And basically, these fairies are devils. And this book said, fairies are particularly associated with twilight. Twilight is, what time of day is twilight? Huh? Sunset or sunrise. It's the halfway between day and night. Where was Lucifer from? He's the son of what? Son of the morning. The morning represents the joining of light and darkness, fusion. So they, the fairies are associated with twilight. They frequently appear at twilight. They speak a mysterious, non-rational twilight language, which can only be understood through the operation of another mode of knowing. Like fairies, they are between creatures, appearing and disappearing in the mysterious radiance of another world. According to Wikipedia, Twilight language is a secret language that even the greatest gurus cannot unriddle. This means that the text of the Buddhist Tantra cannot be understood. Then they have what's called light language. The language of light is a powerful ascension tool that allows us to interact with our guidance team. The guidance team is going to be devils, familiar spirits as well as with one another on a deep soul level. Some people have begun hearing mysterious dialogue or language in their thoughts, or they awaken from a dream having telepathically conversed in a galactic dialect. Many who received, quote, the gift of speaking in tongues, tongues of angels, when they are in a religious setting, have recently realized the validity of this communication with higher realms of consciousness. From a metaphysical point of view, light language allows us to communicate direct, directly with source. Source is their term for God. In other words, now get this. They believe, and some tongues talkers believe this. They believe that having the gift of unknown tongues gives them the ability to speak directly to God, bypassing the mediator. They have no need of a mediator now. They can speak to God directly, and that's a lie. No man cometh to the Father but by Jesus Christ. Um, so they can speak directly with the source without the interference of the programmed human mind while activating light codes to assist with healing and restoration on all levels. These various unlearned languages can be used for healing. What does the charismatic church say? Speaking in tongues gives you healing. Light body activation, interdimensional travel, manifestation of resources, soul retrieval, integration of soul aspects and direct energy. Basically, it's witchcraft. It is witchcraft that they're practicing. Uh, John D was a 16th century occultist, advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. John Dee, along with a man by the name of Edward Kelly, used divination methods such as scrying, which you fill a bowl full of either water or mercury, or a mirror. You remember Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? And the 
who was the queen that said mirror, mirror on the wall? Who's the fairest? She was scrying. She was talking to a familiar spirit through the mirror. And that's what John D did. So he used scrying to contact an angel who taught him, John D, along with Edward Kelly, the secret language that angels spoke. There's certain names for it. Angelical language, celestial speech, language of angels, first language of God, Christ, the holy language, Adamical language. And they basically believe that it's the language that Adam knew it. God had given it to him. And that's how Adam, they, they believe that Adam in naming the animals also gave them life. That the animals were dead and when, no, when Adam would speak their name in this creative power language, that the animals then would come to life and live on the earth. That's, that's what these occultists believe in. Okay? And by the way, um, I heard a message by Jesse Duplantis, who's one of these charismatic name it, claim it preachers down in New Orleans. And he basically believes that same idea that Adam spoke a, a secret language and in naming the animals, he created them and caused them to come to, into existence by giving out their names in this. And they believe that the language that is spoken, if you can speak that language, you can create whatever reality and whatever world you, that you want. You can create wealth, you can create health, you can create Whatever it is that you speak, if you speak it in tongues, it, it is created and manifested right before your very eyes. And it's witchcraft. It's not, it's not, it, it is not the Holy Spirit. It is the result of a familiar spirit speaking through that person. So Proverbs 5, 3, and I'm done. The lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two edged sword. So we have a Bible that's sharper than any two edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. This is basically Babylon. The strange woman in Proverbs is Babylon. Her feet go down to death. Her steps, steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. This is God saying this now. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. And years ago, I went to the door of her house looking to say, maybe they, maybe you do speak in tongues. Maybe you do get filled with the Holy Spirit. And God saved me out of that. It only took one service. But I told God I would never do that again. And I haven't. I'd rather, I'm like Paul, I'd rather speak words that are plainly understood than to speak five words or a thousand words in an unknown tongue that you have no idea what I'm saying. And that's my point in all of this. If God gives people an unknown language to speak, what benefit does it do? None. It does no good whatsoever. You have no idea what they're saying. Would you rather hear a sermon where you understood the words or a sermon where you understood none of the words? It's pointless. Absolutely pointless. It's a, it's a curse, not a blessing. Let's stand to our feet. Father, thank you for not turning me over. Thank you, God, for withholding that from me. I pray, dear God, that you would give us knowledge and understanding of the things that you would have us to know. Not in some mystery form that we'll never understand, but in words that are simple. As Paul said, using plainness of speech and not as Moses. 
Father, thank you for shedding light in our minds and giving us light and speaking words of light instead of dark sentences to us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for filling us with your goodness and teaching us out of your word. Prepare us for days to come, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.